live on Facebook. Greetings, Rink Rats, and welcome to season three of the Blackhawk. Wait, is it season three or is it season four or is it season, it's season five? I think it's season five. Season five. Oh, well, if, if we're wrong, we'll we'll just go with that anyway. Uh, welcome, <laughs> Rink Rats, to season five, episode one of the uh, Blackhawks Ringcast. I am your host, John Jekyll, better known across the internet as Debt Jekyll Guy. Joining me tonight are the usual suspects and a couple of uh, special guests. Um, first, uh, let's introduce our special guest, special guest from Parts Unknown, um, oftentimes in a Speedway gas station where he's uh, perusing and consuming the finest in edibles. Uh, Patrick Stankis, what's happening, man? Oh, not much. Thanks for having me, guys. I was promised a rink swag bag, so I'll be patiently waiting for that in the mail. Yeah, you'll get your wings. Or I'll just run it over from my house. Yeah, Yeah, you'll get your swag bag, pal. (laughs) Fellow Speedway uh, customer there, Gate. That's right. (laughs) That's right. And uh, sort of a special guest, even though he's he's up to his elbows in this mess. That's uh, Jeff Osborne, better known as Gatekeeper. Hello, everybody. And of course, the usual suspects tonight, uh, we have Andy Campbell joining us from the wilds of Northern Michigan. I don't see a moose head behind him, but that doesn't mean he's not there. Uh, Next to him um, on my computer screen, of course, is Sean Fitzgerald, also known as Sean Goldstein, the blogger to be named later. What's up? Uh, Next to him is the inspiration for Sean's alter ego, Um, the, uh, the, uh, General Manager, if you will, the proprietor, the uh, the leader of the Ray Colorado, Aaron Goldschmidt, ladies and gentlemen. Evening, gentlemen. And you gentlemen, use, that term, use that term lightly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Um, and if I if, if I'm missing anybody here, is that everybody? That's everybody. Okay. Uh, Ray Napientek at Hockey Napsack will be joining us a little later on, uh, but we're going to get rolling tonight with our special uh, mock draft. Uh, did, this is, did, you know, did you introduce Eric or did I miss that? Oh, sorry. See, I knew I missed somebody. I knew <laughs> I Aaron's going to love that one. <laughs> last, last but certainly not least. Not memorable. Our, uh, our prospects, our in-house prospects guru, Eric Andrews. Um, Eric, sorry about that. I uh, literally, you fell off my screen and, you know, with me, I have a short attention span. So there you have it. Hey, that's, that's all good. That's all good. Eric, Oh. Wouldn't be wouldn't be a ring cast without JJ Friesen. Oh, all right, I know. <laughs> you back, JJ? No, that's true. That's the truth, man. Right. Your internet connection is unstable. You guys hear me? <laughs> Hello. Your internet. That's not all. Yeah, that's oh, what right. I was thinking, Gate. <laughs> that's right. There's there's a lot of there's a lot unstable up in here. All right, uh, let's get this thing started. We're gonna we're gonna pick the first eleven picks of the draft, even though the Hawks technically pick eleventh. Um, but uh, by virtue of the math, we know that they're actually they're they're actually picking 11th, even though the, the league insists it's 12th. And um, we're going to also, and then Aaron will come in and uh, pick for the Colorado Avalanche. We'll skip ahead several several slots for Aaron to pick for the Avalanche, and then we'll uh, we'll, we'll recap quickly our choices and uh, some more madcap mayhem, and uh, then we'll move on to uh, some some Blackhawk discussion. Uh, we'll talk about the expansion draft. We will talk about some of the trades that have happened, some of the trade rumors that are happening, um, some of the uh, kind of ridiculous things on Blackhawk Twitter. We could talk all night about that. Um, and then uh, finally- Like the fans make- in general? Yeah, some of them, some of them. Yes, some, some of, of them. The, fans, the ones some, that don't read the rink. Some of the fans, some of the media, um, if we definitely don't read the rink. Um, and uh, then we'll maybe close and talk a little bit about- uh, the uh, the Seattle scandal. Kraken. No, not the Seattle Kraken. <laughs> the, not the Krakens. The Seattle Mariners. That's yeah, we could do that. Sure, the Seattle Seahawks. Um, the Seattle Sounders. Their uh, MLS team. We talk about them too. Anyway, um, so let's get this thing rolling. Uh, I guess you know if we had a drum roll, we'd do a drum roll, but we don't have one. So uh, our our guest tonight, Patrick Stankis, our, our special guest is going to lead this thing off by picking for the lowly, much beleaguered, and much maligned Buffalo Sabres. This thing on? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Inside joke there, right, Kate? Yeah. Uh, so Indeed. With the, with the first pick of the 
2021 NHL Draft, the Buffalo Sabres select Owen Power from Michigan. No surprise there. No, no. surprise there. Any comments from the peanut gallery on that one? No, I, I mean, if he, when Ray he, shows up, I know we can back. speak about Owen Power. Uh, Owen Power, I mean, that, that kid's a stud. Yeah. You saw him play with the, the steel when he was 15 years old, and he was dominating then. Uh, and he's got, you know, size and speed and everything. That, yeah. He's going to be a great player. I mean, he's got the potential to be like a headman type player if he, you know, if he develops. Uh, yeah. But he is, uh, he, he's big, he's strong, he's quick. He's, he's yeah. a really good player. Yeah. Well, uh, don't, uh, don't rule him out going back to Herber here either. He may, may go back to Michigan for one more year. That's, sure. that's the buzz. Hey, you know what? I, the way, what we've we'll seen see. with, with college players. Boom. Recently, Nailed it. I mean, what we've seen with college players recently coming to the NHL, um, I think, you know, it may not be a bad move for him, even as, as highly um, uh, skilled and, uh, you know, gifted as he may be. It may be a good thing. Um, John, don't start this. Don't start. No, I'm just saying. I'm just I'm being Mr. I'm Mr. Positive. I can go junior versus college all day with you, bud. <laughs> well, yeah, but yeah, you could lose too. So that's, that's fine. That's, that's how it goes. So, all right. So let's, let's, let's pivot here. Let's move on to a very interesting pick, pick the Seattle Kraken and gate to make it on interesting. Um, with our pick in the first round, we select Carrie price. What? Oh, no. Wrong draft. Sorry. Wrong draft. <laughs> Matthew Beneers, uh, center, center from Michigan. Yeah, uh, solid 200 foot player, really good, really quick, uh, good, you know, really good uh, uh, prospect rankings and everything. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people say he could be the franchise center of the future or just a very good uh, uh, center for this team. And, and you, you know, you want to build around centers, uh, you know, up the middle of the rink. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, as the Blackhawks have shown, when you don't have centers, you're not very good. Right. And uh, when you're starting a, uh, a brand new team in the NHL, uh, having a nice, solid potential number one center right in your first draft uh, is a nice way to start it off. As the Blackhawks have shown, when you don't have anybody over 170 pounds, you're not very good. But that's another discussion. <laughs> All right, let's move along here. Sean Fitzgerald, also known as Sean Goldstein, the blogger to be named later. With the third pick in the 2021. NHL draft, the Anaheim Ducks select Dylan Gunther. Gunther, I, I butcher names, so. Gunther. No, you butcher Gunther. names? Sean, right. come on. I know. It, it's a hard thing to right. it's a hard thing to wrap your head around, but I do. Come on, man. So, Sean, when you get to be my age, you just forget names. It's a lot easier. Oh, a lot my, uh, yeah. It's a lot my, cleaner. I need Prevagen already. It's fine. I need, to, I need to shoot some of that into my veins. All right. Uh, next, the New Jersey Devils and Eric Andrews, our in-house rank.com prospect guru, picking for the Devils. Yeah. So to me, this is an interesting one because a lot of people think that they'll go with one of the defensemen. Um, I feel like they, they certainly could. I mean, obviously, someone like a, a Luke Hughes would be a, an intriguing option for them. But I'm going to go with, um, you know, in, in my opinion, arguably the best winger available in the draft, uh, that being William Eklund. Um, obviously, they've got a couple of nice long-term top six centers already. So I think getting a, a nice, um, you know, offensive threat on the wing to pair with one of those guys would be a good fit. Good pick. Solid, solid selection. So picking fifth, uh, I'm going to jump in there and take my uh, hometown Columbus Blue Jackets. Um, and with the fifth pick in the 2021 rink.com NHL mock draft, the Columbus Blue Jackets will select out of the University of Michigan center Kent Johnson. Uh, I think the Blue Jackets need a centerman. Um, they, uh, you know, Johnson is a, is a guy who uh, has just elite skill, jump, jump, really just jumps off the page. And uh, um, it's, it seems like a smart pick for the Blue Jackets who need to kind of reload at that position in particular, as well as defense. Um, and they have two other picks in the first round, so they could address some of those needs as well. Hey, uh, JJ, would you say he's a big Johnson? Hey, phrasing! Uh, I would actually have no way of knowing that, Kate. <laughs> 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 All 
All right. Uh, picking six um, and coming from this from Traverse City, I believe, Michigan right at the moment. So it's appropriate for the Detroit Red Wings, our good friend Andy Campbell. Uh, on behalf of Steve Eiserman and the Detroit Red Wings, with the sixth overall pick in this year's NHL entry draft, the Red Wings select Jesper Wallstead. Oh, goaltender. Ah. Yep. Hey, four goalies in the in the final four in the Stanley Cup playoffs, all first round picks. Right. Stevie Eiserman picked Andre Vasilevsky. Here we go. I, it's yeah. it's a need. They need a franchise goaltender. They need a lot of help for Dylan Larkin up the middle. Very very tempting, you know, to take Mason McTavish right here. But Stevie Y knows how to draft a first round goalie. Detroit could use it. I think he goes early. I think he goes here. It's going to be a good pick. Yeah, hey, I you're mean, not going to get any I, argument right. about uh, drafting goalies in the first round here. That no, no, big I, fans I, of that here. No, Ray yeah, showed I up. Think, two, Ray showed up. Less than to shoot me down so <laughs> no, right, what do you have to say really about Hawk. Detroit really picking Wallstead Ray oh Ray well, thank goodness he's not here to, to right. get so I, we should move Come on in, I think. Ray. Ray. is That's he talking to Peter Venkman right or what Ray. it's looking at me I think he can hear you Ray what's up there Come he is in, Ray Ooh. All right, Ray. We're gonna you're you're gonna pick for the Hawks. You're gonna get the honor of picking for the Hawks. That's what that's what happens we, when we, we come late. We might want to tell him who's already been picked. So we... yes. So Ray. So thus far, we have we, you're not you're not picking right now, but you will at pick at pick eleven dash twelve. Um, Owen Power went first. Matthew Beneers went second. Dylan Gunther went third. Uh, William Eklund went fourth. Kent Johnson went fifth, and just picked. Sixth overall by the Detroit Red Wings uh, by Andy Campbell uh, was Jesper Wallstedt. So what a terrible. He'd be pick. a lot. He's going to be a lot. He'd have a lot better career if he was picked in the second round, right, Ray? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's a terrible pick, Ray. Ray I didn't <laughs> oh, say Carey Price. I said Jesper first, Wallstedt. First round draft picks. I don't, I don't even. When was the last time they were in a Stanley Cup final? <laughs> right, uh, exactly. four, four in the conference and Stanley Cup final. All four goals. Let's get raised some liquor and do this, right? What do you need? Another so, 20? I don't, well, welcome, to, welcome to the party. From there. Uh, welcome to the party, Ray. You walk in on that one. Yeah, no, that, that's a uh, great pick. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. You ready, Ray? Right. Um, I'm feeling no pain, Jimmy. Before our draft, our mock draft descends into complete mayhem and madness. Um, let's move on. Too late. Um, picking seventh overall are the San Jose Sharks. Um, uh, that pick is going to be made by our special guest, Patrick Stankis. With the seventh pick, the San Jose Sharks Colt select Brant Clark from the Barry Colts. Brant Clark. That's All a right. good pick. That's a good pick. Good defenseman. And under, under the radar, he fell, fell behind with uh, Owen Power, but he, uh, all the scouts seem to rant and rave about him. Yeah. We go if by the there's scouts. anyone who knows about goal or defense when saving goalies' asses, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know we, we like what the scouts say. We don't we don't like so much what, what the fans say on Twitter, but we like what the scouts say. The real scouts, the actual yeah, scouts. The actual scouts, not the not the Twitter scouts. Yeah. Uh, with their heat maps. I'm gonna get Ray going here in a second. Hashtag right. heat maps, baby. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Picking eighth for the LA Kings. Our friend, the gatekeeper. I wasn't even prepared for this one. See? Yeah. Um, so, let's see. How about, well, I mean, this this player was mentioned earlier uh, that he could have been picked higher. Uh, Mason McTavish. All right. Mason McTavish, a centerman. All right. He's in the uh, USHL, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Uh. Uh, Peter, uh, Peter, 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 Pete in the Ontario Hockey League. All right. Okay. Um, next, the Vancouver, the, uh, the, the much maligned and deservedly so Vancouver Canucks, uh, Sean Fitzgerald will pick. Um, JJ, correct me if I'm wrong, but is Luke Hughes still on the board? <laughs> he Dude, is. He is. Then I will take Luke, he, Luke Hughes, defenseman. Excellent pick. 
Excellent pick. I wanted Clark, but I'll take Hughes. All right. Who went um, third overall? Uh, who went third overall? Sorry about that. Third overall was Dylan Gunther. Dylan Gunther. All right. So picking tenth for the Ottawa Senators, who uh, look like the, some of their young guys they've been drafting lately are uh, showing a lot of promise. They've certainly had a lot of lean years. Um, so picking tenth here. Um, Eric Andrews will pick on behalf of Ottawa. Well, I must say, I didn't expect Edmondson to still be here. So that's intriguing, um, but I'm going to stick to my guns. Um, Ottawa has a lot of really solid young defensemen. So I'm not going to, not going to take Edmondson. Instead, um, I'm going to go with a, a guy who I think is one of the best scorers in the draft. They have a lot of guys that can, you know, make plays and distribute the puck and, you know, kind of more well-rounded type of forward. So I'm going to go with a guy that is kind of known for filling the back of the net, that being uh, Chicago Steel's own Matt Coronado. Matt wow. Coronado. All right. All right. All right. So we've had a couple of, a couple of curveballs. I think we had uh, perhaps Jesper Walstead going a little bit higher, perhaps, than we thought. Um, there's a good goalie still on the board in uh, Kosa. Um, and uh, that – moves us to uh really the uh the money pick if you will uh, it's going to be made by our buddy Ray Nepientek on behalf of the Chicago Blackhawks um who really need to hit on every draft pick now um in the first round anyway um in order to uh try to rebuild the way they're trying to rebuild which is not uh not necessarily the smartest way to do it but it is what it is all right Ray my favorite term you ever created rebuilding to the middle Exactly. That's what they're doing. Boy, I I didn't see Coronado going there. I mean, that's definitely an interesting pick. Um, He's going to be a good hockey player. Um, I I think sticking with the goal scorer, um, Chicago would probably end up with, and and I would pick, uh, Chicago would select uh, Chaz uh, Lucius. Chaz Um, Lucius. If he's healthy and um, he's showing that he can skate and his skating is, is improving, it's probably the best goal scorer in, in the draft. Um, you know, he really does have a good shot. I think, you know, you're always worried about that knee issue and, and you know, moving forward, making sure that he is 100% healthy. But I think he'd be a steal at 11 um, at the end of the day. Or 12, I think, uh, the 11. I, I like that pick, Ray. I, I do. Yeah, so I think that's yeah. neat. <clears throat> yeah, Yahoo had, in their mock draft has him going 10, so. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah, what the Blackhawks need. Work. They need a dynamic player. Mm-hmm. They need yeah. dynamic players in their organization. They don't have many. They got to bring it. They got maybe doc. And right yeah. now the outside possibility of Boquist. So you need a dynamic score on the wing to, to mm-hmm. supplement the rest of this. And that would be awesome. Yeah, absolutely. And I think he's an underrated playmaker uh, too. I mean, it, it's definitely not just a one side of his offensive game. Like I said, if his skating's coming along and that knee's healthy, pretty good all-around player but he might be the best goal scorer in in the draft yeah his his shot is really underrated he lets it go quickly it's a fast release doesn't give a goaltender time to set up he'd be a great pick he'd be an awesome pick for the hawks and if hockey doesn't work out for him with that name he could probably be a porn star so he's got that going for him too (laughs) or a death metal singer that's right that's right so Excellent. So we've gotten through the first 11 picks, the, uh, the beloved Chicago Blackhawks, beloved more by some than others, um, uh, have chosen Chaz Lucius. Um, it's an interesting pick and could be a value pick there again, if his, if his, uh, if his injury is uh, all healed up um, and not an ongoing problem. So we're going to skip ahead to 28th overall. Um, we're going to just sort of assume that the next 17 or 16 guys or so are pretty good. Um, and we're going to go to the Colorado Av- Avalanche, where our good friend Aaron Goldstein, Goldschmidt, sorry, I keep mixing you up with Sean. Um, our good friend Aaron Goldschmidt is going to pick on behalf of the Avalanche. With there he is. A. A. Ron. Congratulations, Tampa Bay Lightning, on their second consecutive Stanley Cup. <laughs> with the 28th pick in the draft, the Colorado Avalanche selects forward from the U.S. development program, Tyler Boucher. You done messed up, A.A. Ron! All right, Aaron, tell us about Tyler Boucher. I'm not going to claim to be the uh, the, the most uh, expert on Tyler Boucher. As a matter of fact, I don't think I've ever heard of him. You may have heard of his father, Brian, 
Oh, really? Um, he's in the USN uh, development program now, going to BU next year. Um, he's pretty much Tom Wilson, um, really physical, hits everything, tons of penalties. The Avs really need depth, penalty killing. Just He just needs to learn how to control it. But, yeah, I think the Avs are going to be fine for a while in the top six, and, and it just showed that they have no depth, um, and they have trouble with injuries, and they have trouble – protecting their, their top six. So they, they need an enforcer that's, that can play. Um, and this is the guy. Cool. So let's go back to the Hawks for a minute, because, um, you know, I think, I think there are some out there and I, I'm one, I am one of those some that uh, would like to see Wallstead fall to the 10th picks of the Hawks or excuse me, 11th picks of the Hawks could take him. Um, I'm going to open this up to the, to the group. I mean, what do you guys think? Is that, is that possible? Or is he just absolutely going before the, the Hawks pick? I don't think he makes it to the Hawks pick and I, I would love to see him be able to get a chance, an opportunity to pick him. Um, but I, I don't think he's going to be around. Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't think he'll be there either. I do like the Chaz Lucius pick um, at the same time, if the Hawks were not to get Lucius, either he goes before they bypass him to get Cosa, Sebastian Cosa. I wouldn't be that opposed to that either. I just don't think, having Drew Camesso as the only goaltending prospect in the system, legit goaltending prospect in the system. <clears throat> Sorry, Colin Delia. Um, you know, I just, it would be, you know, I still think they need net mining. Um, either, a, either, a, either a pivot like Lucius or one of those two in the first round. Um, I forgot the name of the second round goalie who's supposed to go. Um, and they could use one of those picks, either trade up for him if they think they can get him. But at the same time, I mean, I just, it is the center and goaltending are so glaring with this club. And defense. Uh, but I don't think Wallstead will be there. And in defense and coaching and management. Yeah. I mean, we can go on yeah. and on. If Wallstead is there, though, you got it. You have to if he's there. Yeah. So does that, uh, does that, um, you know, Riverboat gambler Stan Bowman, does he does he roll the dice and trade up to get Jesper Wallstead? Nah. No. He's got to save all his no commodities way. to trade for Seth Jones. Come on. Ooh, there we go. What well, we're gonna get to, we're gonna get to that top. Get a minute. <laughs> oh, and I and I think Andy was there, referring uh, to so Benjamin all right. uh, Goudreau. Um, so Goudreau. That's a good player. Good goalie. Yeah. Benjamin Goudreau, I think that's, his, I think that's going to be the second round goalie. The second rounder. Yeah, and I think if you see uh, somebody in that top six, top seven fall, and somebody jumps Stan, um, I think that's where you might see a Wallstead fall to eleven. Um, if somebody's trying to jump up and get somebody that they liked at, yeah. you know, three or four, and and they could get him at nine or ten. But other other than that, probably not. Yeah, I don't think he falls below Detroit. I think Detroit, if he's there at six, Detroit takes him. Yeah. I don't know. I've never, I've never understood this whole, you don't draft a goalie in the first round thing. It's, it's, at least, it's a really important position. And there are guys who come along every once in a while that are clearly, you know, head and shoulders above. I mean, you know, like Vasilevsky, for example, and, and uh, you know, Carey Price before Ray decided he sucked. And uh, you know, I, I, I just think, I just, I just think that there are, that it just seems stupid that you would arbitrarily say you don't draft a goalie in the first round. And uh, it seems like if, the, if this, were, if the Hawks were going to do it, this might be the year um, with Wallstead and perhaps if not him, Kosa. Uh, well, Hey, we got to mention Aaron's favorite uh, first round goalie, uh, Jake Ottinger. And uh, the Hawks Good had a one. chance to take him. Yeah. They traded that pick. Yeah. And they then they traded that guy. Yeah. yeah to Buffalo. <laughs> yeah. Not everybody's going to be Rick DiPietro. People need to stop being scared. A lefty goalie. Yeah. Rick well, that, that's why. A curse, a curse of D. Pietro. But then, you know, you got Flurry, Rask, Varley. It's all first round picks. Yeah. All big goalies that have made yeah. a lot of money. Yeah. Stankus, what do you think? You don't know anything about goalies. <laughs> I know I wouldn't have drafted Trevor Kidd ahead of Martin, Martin Brodeur. Wow. <laughs> 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 Touche. Zing. Wow. Dang. All right. All right. Um, all right. So let's, let's move on. We got a lot of other stuff to cover today. That was, that was a very good mock draft gentlemen. I think, I think the picks were astute. 
and uh, insightful and let, you know, just no, nothing there that seemed like a real steaming pile of, you know what? So hey, um, hey, before we, before we move on, I want to give a shout out to Ray and his crew over at FC hockey. Like everyone should go follow all their stuff. Yes. They should buy their draft guide. Yes. Those guys do a, a lot of hard work over there. Yeah. And thank you, Ray, for getting yeah. us a copy of the uh, draft guide. We appreciate yeah. this. And it's very good, very detailed and a lot of great information. And it's well worth the money. So um, everyone go check out FC hockey and follow all of their scouts, especially Ray Napientek. Yeah, actual it's scouts, not actual internet. Scouting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not it's internet not, uh, uh, expert scouts. Actual yeah, not, real scouts. It's not internet heat map experts. <laughs> European G- German heat maps. <laughs> yeah, and I appreciate that plug. And it, it they work their tails off. I mean, when it comes to you know, I try and do it for fun. Um, keeps me busy. Keeps me involved in hockey, learning the game. There's some, we've got some former alums that are, you know, in with organizations. There's some, some guys and gals in there now um, that are making names for themselves that are going to be in organization. So it, it absolutely is a must follow um, for scouting. So I do. Nice. Appreciate it. Good stuff. Good stuff. FC hockey folks, check it out. There's still a couple of days before the draft. You could, you can bone up and get, uh, get smart on the picks. I, I re- highly recommend it. Um, yeah. Bone up and read about Johnson. That's right. That's right. Uh, Sean, you know, we didn't really didn't need that. Right, we didn't. Anyway, let's, let's, let's move. So on that note, let's, uh, let's pivot to, uh, let's talk about the, the, uh, the defense situation with the Blackhawks. Um, they've apparently elected not to uh, protect uh, Nikita Zadorov, which um, I think um, should not have been a really difficult decision. Um, so that's, that's part of the story. But then they also traded, um, you know, arguably their, their best defenseman since, um, Gosh, maybe since Pierre Pelot, um, uh, Duncan Keith, who was part of three Stanley Cups, uh, you know, really um, an integral part in, of the team. And, and, you know, the Conn Smythe Award winner, two, two Norris trophies, Conn Smythe Award winner in 2015, when I, I've never seen a performance like that in the playoffs by an individual player before, personally. Um, and uh, I think sometimes those things get forgotten, but man, was he, was he amazing. And uh you know, so Keith is gone, uh, or what was left of Keith anyway, it's gone to Edmonton. Um, and we'll come back to that. But, uh, you know, so so the Hawk defense today, uh, in spite of the addition of uh, Caleb Jones, um, is, you know, it's it's really difficult to see how they're going to keep any pucks out of their net this year unless they, they do something um, around the defense position um, this summer. Um, I don't think anybody is holding out any hope that, Adam Boquist or Ian Mitchell or Wyatt Kalinuk are going to, uh, you know, take that big of a step forward, if at all, uh, this offseason. So, um, you know, there's been a, a rumor, a persistent rumor that certainly got a little more, um, a little more energy around it when the Hawks did acquire Caleb Jones, that the Hawks would turn around and make a strong move on his brother, Seth Jones of the Columbus Blue Jackets. I still think that's, that trade is a real possibility for the Blackhawks. I know that, uh, you know, it's just such a funny, it's a funny dynamic when, when the, the rumor came around that the Hawks were going to trade uh, Keith Edmonton. All these fans out of Edmonton were yelling and screaming about these, you know, uh, horrible analytics that Keith had. Take it, completely not taking into account that he was babysitting an AHL player most of the year. Um, he was playing for a coach whose defensive system is uh, uh, questionable at best. Um, there was no forwards on the team who really could play any defense, much less win faceoffs. Um, and Keith was probably being asked to do things that, uh, the Duncan Keith of 2011 would have been suited for, but not the Duncan Keith of 2021. Um, and it's just so funny because then you turn, you fast forward a week, Keith's gone. The Hawks are not, the Hawks are allegedly talking to Columbus about Seth Jones. And then all the Hawk fans are <laughs> how bad Seth Jones is because of his analytics last year, not taking into account an insane coach, a lot of injuries on the team, all the best players leaving, including PL Dubois right in the middle of the season. Um, you know, it's, it's just funny how fans are. I mean, it's like their guys are all so much better than everybody else's and other teams guys are so much worse. And it's just, it's like clockwork. It's just amazing. So, well, you know, the, when the Hawks are missing their shutdown guys that are off, their quote unquote shutdown. Right. I know, right? That's all the right there. That's all you had to you had to read. Right. So uh Gate has taken a little uh 
jab there at uh, some fans who were, who were characterizing Zadarov as a shutdown guy. Um, he causes my brain to shut down. Uh, other than that, I'm not sure what he shuts down. Plays but, the El um, Matador defense. Ole as they go by him. It's the whole world gone crazy! Yeah, as I was, as I tweeted this morning, he is going to be the biggest traffic cone in the history of the Pacific Northwest um, if he makes it to Seattle, which would be awesome for Gabe. Um, hey, but before we get into this, I just want to bring up, I, I looked up earlier, Duncan Keith's most, most common defensive partners since 2017. And this is how the list goes. Jordan Osterley, Eric Gustafson, Cody Franzen, Adam Boquist, Henry Yokiharu, Ian Mitchell, Connor Murphy, and Brent Seabrook. Those yeah. are the people the last four years that he's been dragging around the ice. And that right there should tell you the tale of why his analytics kind of dropped. Yeah. He had no help out there. And then he was trying to overcompensate for rookies and turds. You know, when he played with Murphy, that was actually a pretty good pair for a while. You know, yeah, that's, that's the surprising. one guy on there who was a really good player. And that's not surprising. So I'm going to open this up. I've been, I've been rambling on setting this one up and I apologize. I'm going to open this one. What do you guys think? I I'm a big fan of Seth Jones and I'll jump in later with my case for Seth Jones. I wrote a blog on it this week. Um, some people seem to like it. Even people who disagree with it seem to like it, which is, which is good. But um, you know, uh, what do you guys think? Cause, cause I don't think that they have a chance of getting um, Doug Hamilton. I, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think it's in, in the cards, so to speak, for a variety of good reasons. But maybe somebody can make that case why I'm wrong there. Um, and I, I think they desperately need a, a quality top pairing defenseman. Um, if it's not Seth Jones, uh, who is it? And uh, or is it not just it's just not happened this summer? And and the Hawks lose every game this year, eight to six. And don't say the name Adam Bolquist because that is, that's a long way away before anything like that's going to happen. He needs a lot of work for that. So, Pat, we're gonna, you're our special guest. We're going to turn this one over to you first. Uh, first of all, watch what you say about John Tortorella. <laughs> He's a good coach. He just has a short shelf life. That's all. That is mean. coaching God, John Tortorella, to you. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't think uh, – Seth Jones is a Ryan Johansson and his fat, not a shape, but, you know, he didn't fit in the, the system with Tortorella toward the end. And I mean, I would probably make that move out the Hawks, but I w also would mortgage the future for it. But then again, it's the Hawks we're talking about. When's the Stand. last time Baldwin made a good trade? Uh, it's been a long time. It's been a long time. Almost as long as that pause. Has huh? he ever? <laughs> Has, has he ever made a good trade? I yeah, I mean yeah, I yeah. think he has. There's a couple in there. He had a couple uh, uh, that were that worked pretty well. I, I I know they're out there. I can't think of them off the top of my head, but I know well, there were a, a couple. Antoine Vermette. Really Antoine Vermette. Antoine Vermette. Antoine. Yeah. Yeah. Happy birthday, happy birthday, Antoine There you go. You, you could go young. Johnny Oduya. You got to give him Johnny yeah, Oduya. Johnny Oduya. So you know what he made. He did. You're right. And, you know, the thing about this trade is unlike dumping Brandon's salary or dumping Panarin because you're afraid you can't pay him or dumping Jalmerson because you're afraid you can't pay him. I mean, this is a trade where, where Bowman's like going out and going for a top level player. Um, and when he's done that sort of in the past, um, you know, he's had some mixed results. Um, so anyway, uh, Ray, what do you think? I think, uh, you know, kind of like Stank has said, if you're not mortgaging the future, you know, I, I know we kind of talked a little bit about, you know, Kane would be an untouchable and, you know, guys like that. And I know Doc gets thrown in there, Debrinka gets thrown in there. I mean, there, there's nobody that's really an untouchable when you're rebuilding, but I would have a hard time giving up on on somebody that's a little bit on the younger side. I don't think Debrinka would even be in an option for him. You guys know how much I, I like him as a hockey player. Uh, somebody that, you know, score 40, they just don't, you know, fall out of trees, but um, you know, if, if you could get them, um, you know, for guys that are not going to, you know, kill you moving forward, I don't see why it doesn't make sense. Um, you know, his brother's here. I know why you made that move. I think that's something that I joked around. Do we know if they like each other um, before you move? <laughs> you know, I, I don't like that guy. I would never play, for, you know, but, um, you know, so, I mean, you got his brother here. I think it makes sense. I think it's going to be interesting if they do get him, you know, if, if it's uh, that contract, you know, I, I also said, Hey, you don't want to kill yourself on that back end of, you know, a, a, that's fifth, sixth, seventh year. It'll be somebody else's problem as a GM by then. But um, you know, if you could bring him in and then, you know, I mean, not to 
you know, if, if you brought in somebody like a Jamie Alexiak, I think if you've got Jones and an Alexiak that, you know, are coming here and, and, you know, you feel a lot better about that defense than you do right now. But again, I, I would just be nervous that he's going to give up too much or give up a part that could be worth something down the line. And it just doesn't pan out. So you're bringing a Ben Shiro, right? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just something that, you know, again, you know, was he healthy? Was he bored? You know, what was going on the last, uh, you know, a couple of years? And, you know, as we saw with Duncan Keith, you know, you guys talked about, you know, usage and who you're playing with and coaching and systems. You know, there's a lot that goes in it than just, you know, numbers. And if you bring him in, you feel like he's he's a big part of it. And it's a Stromer and a first and, you know, Ian Mitchell. <laughs> Sorry, Aaron. You know, I, I have no problems with that. If you're talking about the three guys that I mentioned, you better be sure that, you know, he's your 26 minute a night that that's going to shut down everybody. Yeah. I, I've been, I'm going to turn this over to somebody else, but I I've been saying that it's going to be something like Kubelik, a first in Mitchell, if they do it through Kubelik, I say, because they have I'm a lot in. of debt, a lot of scoring forward depth, scoring winger depth, and he's going to want a lot of money next year. That's not a secret. And, uh, and so when they draft Chaz Lucius, they're going to have the replacement. Yeah, so. And Jeremy Colleton doesn't doesn't seem to like Kuba Lee because he doesn't seem to play him very often. Yeah, and really uh, I just don't see I don't see Dylan Strom getting that done for Yarmo. Yarmo's not stupid, right? See, there you go, Andy. Maybe he doesn't know. Yeah. Right. All right. So, uh, with with that said, Andy, what, what's your take on all this nonsense? I would love to have Seth Jones. I mean, I, he's twenty seven right 26. now. Twenty seven, maybe twenty eight. Twenty six. 26, 26, almost got it, got it, got it. Uh, hell of a hockey player, you know, had a bumpy ride, but I mean, he is a top two pairing defenseman. Um, he's terrific. He'd be a staple. Um, I really think that from a marketing standpoint, if you lose a Duncan Keith and you need to sell more jerseys, a Jones is a good one to have and to make him a, a premier figure publicly with the organization. I think that that's really important, it, but it, it all does come back to what you're giving up. I mean, personally, I'm not willing to throw Kirby Doc in there right now. Um, I know we, and we've gone back and forth on that a lot, but I am very intrigued by the idea, JJ, you tweeted about it, about Borgstrom being part of a packet uh, to go and get him. Um, and it does, and I'm fine with moving Kubalik too. I, I actually, um, you know, think that, I think Kubelik is a very expendable hockey player as a winger and, and with his skill set. So, but the other part of this though, is that, you know, it, it, if they're really rebuilding, I mean, we, we always talked about like, are they really rebuilding or are they really not? And so then all of a sudden you got up oh, Aaron Goldschmidt just mentioned that Borgstrom is protected or something <laughs> like that has, I don't know what's going on. There's so much chatter going on right now in the chat. Um, we talked about are the Hawks really rebuilding or not? And we talked about two critical parts moving if they are actually rebuilding. One of them is gone and they didn't retain any salary, which is huge. Duncan Keith is now gone. Patrick Kane probably won't go anywhere anytime soon unless he really, really wants to. That's why Duncan Keith was moved because he wanted to. Right. So if, if Zadarov is actually, if the Kraken do us a favor by taking Zadarov, you know, do you have to spend, you know, do you have to use all this cash right now and chase Jones if it means that you're giving up a big part of the future? Or do you just say, hey, let's just hit a wall for a few years, get kicked around and actually stockpile picks and stockpile salary and, and get going at a later date? It's something to think about. I mean, the blue they have been be getting just, kicked around for a couple of years, though. I mean, we're, we're but not. Yeah, but not the kind of kicked around. I think we're talking well, I, about. I, yeah. Not oh, yeah. In, not, 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 I mean, we're we're talking like. ECHL blue line right now yeah, right. Uh, right. without the addition of Seth Jones. So, right. I mean, and that's, and that's real. And, and, you know, Lankinen will be, his career will be over halfway through the season, the amount of shots he's going to do. So just go um, get Dougie. You know, again, that's are you what you do. Just go get Dougie. Sign Dad Hamilton. Well, just pick about- him off the rack and just put him in your cart and you take him up there and you pay for him. You just scan him over to scanner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i don't know if it's you know if it's if it's some sort of package that's livable after the fact <laughs> kubelik's included um even if, even if hagel's included in that somehow i'm okay with that too would love to see seth jones here yeah uh eric's eric's sitting there kind of smiling you might call some might call that a smirk 
and uh, it seems he's got something he wants to say. So Eric, jump in here, buddy. Sure. I mean, I, honestly, I would echo a lot of what Andy said. Um, I think that, you know, and I, I know JJ, you would agree with this, that having a guy like Seth Jones on the team would just, you know, th- that would be huge for this team. Um, you know, he's, he really is exactly what they need back there um, just to help stabilize things a bit, if not a lot. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, to me, it kind of just depends on, on what that package is going the other way. Um, to me, for a guy like Seth Jones, I would not move Kane, Doc, or Debrinkit, but anyone else would be on the table. Um, and again, that's just for Seth Jones. I mean, if we're talking somebody else, then, you know, anybody could be on the table depending on who it is. But I don't know. I think my big thing is that, you know, yes, Seth Jones is barely still 26, uh, will be turning 27 soon. And you know, yeah, he's still going to be a very solid player for a number of years, but realistically, how long is it going to take for this team to get back to contending? And you're, you're probably looking at least three or four years. So now Jones is, you know, 30, 31, 32, you know, how, I mean, is that going to be worth it to go out and get him and, you know, potentially the best years of his career are not necessarily being wasted, but they're not really being used to their, you know, full potential you know, as this team is trying to get back on its feet. So, 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 so Eric, I have to interrupt you though. Mm-hmm. How do you get back to that point without a guy like that? Not picking 11th or 12th or 13th, 14th, 15th every right. year, which is what they're doing. So I, I, it's, it's a chicken or the egg thing. And I wouldn't worry so much personally about his skill falling off by the time he's 31 or 32. I mean, sure. Guys get debilitating and, and degenerative injuries, but uh, that wouldn't concern me. I, I, I think the, 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 um, the concern about the, the return going the other way is, is certainly valid. It had, in every, you have to look at that in every trade. But I, I, to worry about, you know, it would be one thing if the Hawks were picking top five every year. Then you could say, yeah, we could, we could do it through the draft and we can get back to that level. And then we don't have to worry about what he'll be when he's 32. But this team, this team is, in, is in deep doo-doo. And this is a team that would like to at least sniff the playoffs every year. That's their model. They're thinking they're going to make the playoffs and be a contender again while Kane and Taves are, are still playing. So <laughs> it seems to me, I know, it's hysterical. But, so, but, but it seems to me if you have any hope of that, you have a guy like Jones who's 26. My, my cutoff for a rebuild has been 26. If the player's 26, you get him. If he's over 26, he may not fit a rebuild. Like Mark Andre Fleury, who's 106. So, anyway, um, right. I go mean, ahead, Eric. I, I, I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, you're fine. I mean, and that's valid. Eric, I think that, he is a bad, bad man. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> um, no, I, I think that's legitimate, and I, I totally agree with you. The problem is, is that they keep screwing everything up, and they're picking in the middle of the first round. That's the problem. You know, they're yeah. trying to rebuild but they don't have anything to work with so right so i think that's kind of you know and that even goes into you know what is the trade package is if you know if you don't really have much that you have in the system right now and you're dealing away from that you know and and even i would say you know if jones was 24 or 25 i think that's a different conversation too you know he is kind of right on that edge of you know, is it worth it or not, in my opinion? Um, you know, and, and like you said, I, I do think that probably the best long-term thing is that they actually bought them out and start getting quality picks rather than picking, you know, 11 through yeah. 17. They won't do that, though. Well, and the, and the funny thing about that, too, is is you're going to get comparisons from, like, what Boston did and how Boston picked in the middle of the first round, and they were able to reload some guys – and Tampa Bay's done that. And a lot of teams have been able to do that. The problem is, is you're looking, you're talking about the Chicago Blackhawks who don't draft that great. They do okay. And a lot, you know, but overall, they're not that good of a drafting team. So they don't steal people like, you know, right, right. Cole Caulfield or whatever, or, you know, a, a, someone who would have went later. They don't find those diamonds in the roughs like a lot of other teams do. 
So the, you know, either you bottom out with the, with the way this staff is and the way this front office is, or you're just going to keep picking guys that are middle six guys, you know, Dominic Cahoons or whatever. And none of those guys, you know, you're going to need some of those guys to take you to the Stanley cup final, but you're going to need dynamic players. And the only way you're going to be able to get dynamic players and be able to succeed is by having dynamic players on entry level contracts or stuff like that, where you can afford these guys and you're not paying them seven, $8 million. Yeah. All right. Gate, thank you for restoring us to sanity with that, with that comment. Um, all right, Aaron, I see you sitting back there with that Cheshire cat grin. What's your take on all this Chicago Blackhawk nonsense? I'm not going to say that uh, trading for Seth Jones is the dumbest thing the Hawks could do. I'm, I'm feeling that, but I just want to, <laughs> I just, I think my point is, I think Seth Jones is going to field a lot more than just, you know, dangling Brendan Hagel. Um, yeah. I agree. Matthew Shane got a first, a second, a third, Shane Bowers, former first and Sam Gerard, former uh, second round pick. And that's a, that was a second line center. Um, and that was this, a similar situation where Duchesne still had some years left on his deal. So if you're, uh, you know, Columbus, why wouldn't you just play the waiting game and get the biggest, uh, your biggest package and that I'm sorry, guys, it's going to have to start with Kirby doc. No choice. Did you say biggest package? Where is a a Ron right now? <laughs> All so right. I would love to hear who who's interested in uh, in serving up Kirby Doc because it sounds like most of you aren't. I'm gonna I'm gonna offer a, a perspective on that, um, but I'm gonna wait and I'm gonna let others speak. Sean, what do you think? Sadly, Aaron raises a good point. Um, sadly, <laughs> sadly, <laughs> the uh, the rarely. Price- it had to happen. <laughs> no respect. Occas- occasionally. <laughs> it's uh, Seth Jones er, is going to take a lot to acquire. So maybe Kirby Doc is going to be uh, included in the deal, unfortunately. And to piggyback off what Eric said earlier, they've got to, they've got to pick a direction. Like if, if you're going to just bottom out, then you'll get your top five picks. But I don't think you want to do that to, like they want to sell tickets. That's yep. the most important thing. Yeah. They want to make money. So you're not yep. going to bottom out. Yeah. So they have the controversy going on right now with the, the scandal. So they've got to change the narrative. So acquiring Seth Jones changes the narrative. It, it changes the narrative. And that's a big thing I think they have to do. And Kirby Doc is young. Yes. But does he sell jerseys? He doesn't, his jersey isn't the most popular one in the building. It's still Kane and Taves. So I, that's why I think he could be included in the deal because they're not going to trade guys that impact their Jersey sales, which impacts their money. So I, I'm looking at this from purely filling seats, making money. They want to sniff the playoffs. They hope to get some of that playoff revenue. They have to make this deal. And if Kirby docs included, that's the way they, they got to do it. Uh, but the other thing right. is Who's, Columbus can just say, just, Oops, sorry. Yeah, you're good. Columbus could just say, Jones, you're going to, you're going to play out the first part of the season and we'll move you at the deadline. You know, if they don't, if they don't get what they want, I mean, he's still under contract for this coming season. You know, Columbus certainly has the track record of benching players, moving guys, benching the guys that they just acquired. You know, a lot of that's Tortorella too, but I mean, if they don't like the offers they have, I mean, you know, a deadline deal wouldn't be the worst move for them either. I mean, again, yeah. we, we keep, we've said it before, but going to Steve Eiserman, look at what Eiserman got for Anthony Mantha at the de- deadline. I mean, it's absurd. Yeah. Yeah. The haul that he got. So I think, Red, um, I think red team won't be moving. like that. They, they just, teams aren't doing that anymore. It's too much of a price. They're yeah. getting away first round picks for, you know, a month of a guy. It's just, I don't think that's happening. I think they're yeah. going to try to get a deal now. I think if yeah, they too. did deal him with the deadline, they'd have to have an extension already guaranteed before right, he's right, right. Right. Well, that's that's going to happen. Nobody is going to give them anything of value this summer for him unless there's a there's an extension agreed to. Right. And and frankly, what may be holding this thing up is, um, you know, getting Jones to to agree to an extension. Um, that it could be that far along. Um, but that's, that's the more, that could be actually the more challenging part of this than getting two teams to agree on return. All right. Is there anybody else who's not weighed in on this topic yet? Ray, is that you? 
Uh, no, I weighed in, but with Kirby Doc, I, for me, that's tough. I, I know what we've seen out of him. I know he, he was, he wasn't ready, probably still was maybe a little bit young last year when he got hurt. Um, off the top of my head, we've got one more year, a bridge deal, and then maybe seven years after that, you know, he's still an, un, he's unfinished. We don't know what he had. He's only playing 15, 16, 17 minutes a night. Um, you know, you would have to feel pretty good about Seth Jones coming here and being your lockdown guy before I gave up eight more years of, you know, he's going to be a big boy, you know, Kirby Doc. But then again, we've seen a lot of players that are get drafted, you know, that, that go other places and struggle. You would have, I would have to sit down and the guy would have to tell me, Seth Jones is your number one guy that's going to play 26 minutes a night for the next eight years. If he can't tell me that, I'm not ready to give up on Kirby yeah. Doc. I think, I think that's all uh, really valid. And I think that's, you know, this is what scouts and uh, talent evaluators and GMs are, are paid to do. And, um, you know, it's interesting. I mean, Doc, when I look at him, I, I, what I don't get is, and here's the thing, I think he may end up being a great player. Um, but what I don't get is all these people who are convinced that he's the next Jonathan Taves or the next this or, or the next that. I, I, you know, I've watched hockey for a long time. Um, and, and I, I'm not sure what he's the next. I mean, when I look at him and I read some of the scouting, the actual scouting on him, that's, you know, been, been published. Um, the athletic had an article where some scouts weighed in on him and that one of them said, you know, the team knows that he's not the next case and he may end up being a 55 or 60 point a year guy, but still a really good player. I look at him and I see a guy that big, who's, who's not super physical at this point, but skilled. He could end up being like Jason Spezza. Jason Spencer was, was a guy who, who was a very, had a very good NHL career, but he was never quite what they thought he was going to be either uh, when, when he was drafted. I think he was taken second overall way back when. And, and uh, um, so it's, it just remains to be seen. And I, so I, when people say, you know, hang up the phone if they ask for Doc, I don't know. I don't know if you do. I don't know if you don't. I, it, it, I don't know. Um, I just think that I think that they have a, the Hawks have such a glaring need at defense and I, I, I'm a Seth Jones fan. I'll tell you why you guys, cause I, I've seen him play in person quite a bit and I saw him play two games in the playoffs back in 2019, one against Tampa and the other one against Boston. He was the best player at the ice for either team. Um, so he had a, he had a rough year last year. Uh, um, you know, absent a serious and debilitating injury though, this is a guy who has, um, number one, great two-way defenseman, a force on the ice at times in him. Um, and that's what the Hawks need because they get him. Then not only do they have that guy, but then that's <laughs> in second pairing matchups. Uh-oh. Third pairing matchups. And, and, and it, it all starts to make sense. Did I freeze? You yeah, you know what's going to happen next? You're going to give us the winning lottery numbers and you're going to freeze when it happens. Yeah, probably. So I was just saying, I, I, th I think that the trade makes sense is what the returns. The other thing I would not rule out is Borkstrom going back um, because Borkstrom is, is her and he's a Finn. So Yarma Kekalainen has some uh, experience with him. And Stan Bowman claims he was the greatest college player ever. So I'm, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, two things on the Seth Jones thing, because I actually really didn't weigh in on it. Uh, I just interrupted everybody else. Dude, sorry. Uh, this, the Seth Jones thing. Um, I like Seth Jones. I like the player, but again, it has to be part of the quote unquote package. What is the package? Um, if it's too much, like uh, you, you might want to back away. I mean, you can't, they can't ask for the world and you can't give them the world. You really got to be, you have to make a shrewd move. Stan Bowman has to make a shrewd move. Find a way to, I mean, he actually kind of uh, made a, a shrewd move uh, with Duncan Keith by not having to retain salary. Everyone was surprised he didn't do that. So he's got to make shrewd moves. If he doesn't make shrewd moves, like this is going to be a loss. The trade will be a loss one way or the other. He's just going to do it because that's what he does. But, you know, there's another third overall pick who struggled in his career that's a center. Yes, we're cocky and net, cocky and yeah, and Dylan Strom, yeah, and Dylan Strom too. Some centers that have struggled, and and that could be Kirby Doc's trajectory too. Like Kaki and Emmy, he started off his rookie season was pretty good. Uh, you know, he looked promising. Everyone seemed to think that, like, you know, well, maybe they didn't reach for him. But then he 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 had kind of a regression a little bit, and he played well in the playoffs, but he didn't have a great season. So. 
you know, and, and don't Strom too. Like he, he, he got dumped out of an organization after a couple of years because he wasn't, uh, you know, producing. So it could be that as well. So, you know, you, there, there is validation on both sides for the, the, you know, the Jones thing and for the, you know, would you give up that doc for a known entity? Would you give up an unknown entity for a known entity kind of thing? Right. Um, right. You know, so, but as far as, you know, Jones goes, I mean, he's, he's a number one defender and they don't grow on trees and they aren't necessarily Adam Bokefist just because you say he is uh, because <laughs> he might only, Adam Bokefist might be a number two or a number three defenseman, which is fine, yeah. but he's not necessarily the future. He's not necessarily going to be the next Duncan Keith or the next, you know, what throw, throw a random Norris winner in there. So yeah, you have to weigh the options. I mean, that's what Stan's job is to do. Um, if it didn't include Doc, I would say just about, you know, and, and of course, to bring it. Uh, you're not going to trade to bring it. Uh, even though I like Kubalik, if Kubalik was part of it, like, I think you can, I can think you can eat that deal. Like Kubalik and maybe you have to give a bulk fist and a draft pick. And okay, maybe, but I, I don't, I don't know that I want to give up on Doc just yet because of right. the, you know, how high you got, you were gifted this number three overall pick for this guy who's a big center that you haven't been able to get any other way. And we haven't even tried to, de- or gotten to develop him yet. So, but we don't even know if he's a center yet. That's the thing. That's why I go back to Jason Spezza. Cause he's a guy that they, they never, who never really always established himself as a center. He went back and forth from center to wing. I mean, we got to see, I mean, I think docs like 30% on face off so far. I mean, he's young and he's young and he may get a lot better. He also has, he also had a wrist injury and, and you know, um, that reminds but definitely me of, you can't trade David camp because his no. biggest face off percentage is over 50%. Right. Yeah, so who else is going to lose that face off right into overtime. Right. <laughs> well, I think that they're hoping that it will be tapes, but I think the fact that they retained camp uh, or they protected camp may, may say something about their confidence in, in Taves uh, making it all the way back. I don't know. And let's, so let's pivot. I mean, this has been a good discussion. I think we all agree that it's very unlikely that they're going to sign um, Doug Hamilton. So um, this has been good discussion. So let's, let's move over to, uh, you know, the uh, expansion draft. And uh, I think, I think for the Hawks, we could talk about Taves and uh, the, the relative likelihood that he'll be back or be back um, as, as the Jonathan Taves we, we know and love, or, you know, some, uh, some approximation of it, I guess, um, because it's easy to say, well, he's, he's back. <laughs> Whenever JJ um, makes a point, it potentially <laughs> severe. Aaron, did you get that picture? <laughs> you just my back probably got the actual diagnosis like the real scoop on taves and it was frozen we had no, am I right there. am i so, back yeah you're back now am i back so I, i'm gonna it's whenever i start rambling i freeze i think it's i think it's the the facebook's way of telling me to shut up f up but you you're know eating up too much bandwidth i think it's questionable knowledge. no with my lack thereof um i think it's um i just think it's it's very uh questionable um, how, whether he's going to be fully back or how long he'll be back. And um, so, so that leaves the this week, week, week on the, um, what do you guys think? I'm <laughs> Anyone who understood that question. Can go. <laughs> Ray. <laughs> What do you think of Jonathan Tays? Uh, the Jonathan Tays situation, I think, is yeah, right. Yeah. That so, someone talk. He's asking. Talk. It's great to have him back. I mean, I, I you really hope he's healthy and every. You know, I mean, you just don't. You, you get what he told us and stuff along those lines. If he's healthy, I, I think he's a great piece. I mean, I, he definitely was not what we remembered. Maybe his last season, season and a half, but I, I mean, I, I think he's. I mean, he's Jonathan Taves, right? I mean, if he's back at 90% of what we saw, I mean, he's going to be taking all the big draws. He's going to be killing all the big penalties. He's going to be on the ice. He's going to be your captain. You know, I'm a little nervous. He may say, hey, I'm looking to get out. And you want to make sure that you're getting as many assets as you can for him. But, um, you know, for me, I mean, how can you argue with one Jonathan Taves on the ice uh, versus 
everybody else. Not like he's coming back to a Stanley Cup champion and you're like, where does he fit in? You know, I mean, he fits in as your number one center and he's taking every draw that's important. Ever. <laughs> All right. Uh, Andy, what do you think? No, happy for him that he's back. Hope he's ready to play. Uh, really, you know, we're, we should all be rooting for him. This is what he does. This is what he's meant to do. Hopefully he's healthy enough to keep doing it for a while. Um, he will certainly help a team. He'll help the young guys, um, you know, come along. The young players that, that are there that might have a future. Some don't. Some might. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm nervous, uh, you know, like Ray, I, I hope he doesn't come out for 10 games and we see this really quick demise and then that's it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, like I said, he's Jonathan Taves, and it would be great to, great to see him back in action. Pat. Well, for one, I got to say, uh, JJ, it's nice that I'm not the one with all the bandwidth problems like in the past. But, uh, you know, with Taves, <laughs> it's, it, it's such a big question mark, but I think with his history and what he's accomplished, it'd be – Probably it should be terrible to see him come out and maybe play 10, 15 games like the guy said, and then that's it. I'd, I'd almost rather him attempt to do, you know, skate in the off season here. And if his body's not right, just listen to your body and just, you know, end it. It's uh, it'd be a tough way to go either way, but I think that's the better of the two options. And uh, that's you know, called the cool. Brent Seabrook method. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, got it. Says the 47 yeah. year old goalie. <laughs> Who doesn't know how to hang them up? <laughs> <laughs> One of these days, I'll make the drive around the corner and get some uh, behind-the-scenes footage for you guys. <laughs> but I mean, with Taves, I mean, it'd just be with the way he is, you know, team legend and everything like that. Um, I'd hate to see him go out like that, just a shadow of what he was. Yeah. So I hopefully I won't cut out this time. I mean, the question I was trying to ask before technology betrayed me was, uh, you know, it, it, he, I think it's questionable whether he comes back or how well. And so, you know, what do we make of this team overall with being kind of weak down the middle end at D? And, and I do think Taves impacts that. So um, with that, I'm going to just broaden it out a little bit. Let's turn it over to Sean. Sean, what do you think? Sean. I'm sorry. What was the question? Ah! I had to step away for a second. Sean Goldstein. All right, Eric, you, you answer it. You just made the list! <laughs> Sounds good. Um, I mean, I guess in my mind, and, and this kind of goes with the, the first part of the conversation and also with this question, in my mind, you can't necessarily rely on Taves to really give you anything. So I would say, you know, whatever he ends up giving you, just enjoy it, and yeah. that's kind of a bonus. Yeah. Um, you know, we just you know, even though we have a little bit better of an idea of what's going on now, we still don't really know what the implications of that are, are going to be when he's back on the ice. So, you know, I think, you know, obviously expecting him to be, you know, what he used to be, I think is just foolish. Um, you know, so yeah, I mean, just to reiterate, I think you kind of just enjoy whatever you get out of him and, and, you know, not the necessarily plan, you know, to just be without him for good but I mean you, you know like I said I don't think you can really rely on him for much of anything at this point yeah. um Aaron um I, th I think that Jonathan Taves coming back is pretty dangerous um after kind of what I was reading about it um I would just hang it up at this point you know <laughs> Got, like I mentioned before with Tom Wilson guys like that are out there and they don't really care what kind of injuries you've had so, um, I don't know. I'd like to see him just kind of, I hate to say one last skate, but yeah, I just like to see him just call it quits. There's nothing to gain here except for cash on the table. And I'm sure that's not an issue right now. That's an interesting perspective. Um, and I may come back to that. Uh, Sean, do you understand what we're talking about now? I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> um, yeah, I think like Eric said, anything he gives you should be counted on as a bonus, but you shouldn't pencil him in for top line minutes right away. Um, you've got to be guarded um, like like Aaron alluded to because you don't know what his health is going to be. I mean, we, we 
fully don't understand what it what he really had and if he takes a hit from a Tom Wilson or something like that, he could be done. So you almost have to treat him like kind of, you have to protect him at first and protect him against himself. Cause you know, he's going to want to play. He's going to want to be in top line minutes. He's going to want to kill penalties and all this stuff. And you have to, you have to just kind of ease him back into it. See if he can give you anything. If he can't, then you have to have the conversation with him and talk, go the Brent Seabrook route. Be like, listen, like, this isn't going to work. Like we advise that you are never going to play again. We'll pay you and you're going to go on LTIR the rest of your career, which is sad, which we don't want Jonathan Taves to go out like that, especially considering Seabrook had that happen to him and Corey Crawford retired under bad circumstances. Marion Hosa had the, the skin condition and just disappeared. Like it's just, it's sad that all the stars of that, uh, those three cups are just going to fade away. And I hope, I'm hoping Taves is in the next one, but I have a feeling he's going to be sooner rather than later. Anybody else want to weigh in on this? What if he comes back and he's 100%? That's a valid question, and, and that could happen. Um, you know, he's, if, if, he knows what's wrong with him now. Um, you know, but, but what he, what is wrong with him leaves him vulnerable to infections. And, um, you know, I guess he was apparently a COVID long hauler too. So the odds are not great that he's going to remain hundred percent healthy for a long time, but I do think he could come back and have a really good year still. Um, that's possible. Guy's a tremendous athlete. Um, so we'll have to see. I just, I just don't think that Jonathan Taves can be counted on for two, three, four more years. And if we're talking about when this team's gonna be uh, competitive again, I don't think he's gonna be part of it. Well, I mean, it, regardless if he's 100% or not, I mean, his, his role needs to be limited somewhat. I mean, yeah. he can't first team power play, kill penalties, first line center. I mean, we're seeing what that's doing to a guy like Patrice Bergeron right now in Boston, where you know he, he, you can't count on him for everything anymore just because of his age and you well, know, the amount of tread on his doc. tires so i'm hoping that can't trade doc then what's that can't trade doc then right exactly that's a huge part of it that's a huge part yeah, of it too but it's also i, I just also hope that remember what Jonathan Taze like, was before he went out yeah right you know he was he i'm not saying he was yeah. a bad player but jonathan Taze was transitioning towards second line type center player um and if yeah, well, it's he, less than he was, that he was, being, he was being asked to, yeah he was being asked yeah. to do too much and i because they yeah just for sure have the for sure and they don't have any depth yeah, so it's I, like yeah but yeah that's a yeah, yeah but theme. look what they do they gonna they're gonna bleed that turn up dry just like they did with duncan keith yeah. oh, and they would like to do it to patrick kane that they're just gonna keep throwing them out there because that's their safety blanket to, so they don't get murdered every night. They're just going to keep throwing these guys out there for 26 minutes a night. Yeah. And so I just, I just hope Jeremy Colleton has the wherewithal to recognize <laughs> part of that, which I don't know if he does. Cause no. I don't, I don't like him. Don't trust him. So. All right. All right. Let's, let's move on. This has been, this has also been well, well mined. Um, what about, so, okay. We've covered a lot of stuff here. We don't, we're all counting on, on Nikita Zadorov being taken off our hands by the Kraken. I don't think we're going to get that lucky, though, but we'll see. Um, let's talk about – so let's close, I guess, on, on this scandal issue. Um, my only uh, lingering issue with it is the fact that, you know, yeah, it did happen in 2010, and the people who want to sweep it under the rug will point to that and say it was a long time ago, et cetera. But it is pretty – what happened, if it's true, as reported, is pretty heinous. Um, and I guess the thing that, that bothers me is the way the Blackhawks are, are kind of as an organization going about this. And it does seem like they're trying desperately to create any kind of alternative story or, or narrative to di divert attention from this thing. And I just don't have a lot of faith that um, they're going to step up as an organization and do what they should and do the right thing and um, take responsibility. I don't think they're going to. They talk about they always talk about being accountable and they never they never are. And this is a classic example. That's my editorial. You guys have at it. 
Yeah, I, uh, JJ, I think they're 100% responsible for this. Um, for they had, yes, within their, according to their arguments, within their legal rights, they didn't have an obligation to report this. But within their, if they want to be a leader in the community, if they want to be anything more than just a sports organization trying to make money, they had a moral obligation to report this. They didn't. This person was able to gain another job where he was able to interact with kids. And I, I know their legal argument is that, well, they didn't give them a positive recommendation. Most places don't ask for that. They verify your dates of employment, like your, your references. So by them not re reporting this, they're 100% responsible. I think the way they're handling it is despicable. They hire the law firm that represented USA Gymnastics in defense of Larry Nasser. Like that tells you all you need to know. It's a law firm that that is versed in trying to cover up sexual assault. So it's despicable. It, nothing's gonna be done. La their investigation is gonna find Nobody guilty of wrongdoing. They did with everything within their legal rights. It's going to be swept under the rug and it's going to go away. And it's disgusting. Great. Sean, I don't think you should hold back your feelings. It's really not good for you. <laughs> um, Andy, what do you think? Well, I don't, you know, everyone is, not everyone, but the Twitter universe is holding their breath that Stan Bowman is going to say something of significance on Thursday. He will not. Um, he won't comment on it. Um, and he's, he's the mouthpiece. That's not his decision. The organization will tell him not to comment on it. Um, uh, there's so many layers to this and there is probably a lot of stuff about this that we don't know. And the general public doesn't know. Um, the stink of it is really, really bad though, is really, really bad. And it's tough to ignore those facts. And it's really, but the, the Blackhawks to your point, JJ, they're, they're going to go down swinging they're 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 gonna fight this thing as much as they can without any recognition of wrongdoing and it's very sad that we're at this point and uh and pretty disappointing and kind of hard to be a fan uh truly um so that that's all i've got in it you know i i know it's you know maybe i'm one of those wait till the facts totally come out type guys but you know right now this doesn't look this doesn't look good uh, not one bit. And um, it's really a shame that it's going on. All right, Pat, what do you think? Um, as the great George Costanza once said, the more you peel an onion, the more it stinks. And uh, it, I mean, I haven't really read too much about it. I've kind of just wait till the facts come out type person. But, you know, on the grand scheme of things, it doesn't look good. And for a team that's so hung up on how they look PR wise, they look terrible. They look like a bunch of morons, frankly. Um, suddenly the mascot or the logo on the Jersey isn't their worst uh, thing in the world that they got to deal with right now. Yeah, right. Um, but all, when, when everything comes out, I, I don't think they're going to be looking that good. And, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how loyal the fan base is and where they go from there. I mean, it, it would be really hard to to be a fan if they're 100% guilty of everything that they've been they could have done and, or prevented and, and didn't. So yeah. going forward, it'll just be an interesting, you know, investigation wise or or whatever you want to call it. But you know, I I agree with what Andy said. Stan Bowman is not going to say a damn thing. I mean, right. you're probably going to get the we like our team comment to every question <laughs> that is is asked of him. And that's the way he is. And he's, I think Stan Bowman's one of the most arrogant people out there. So yeah, yeah. I don't really have anything good to say about him. But, yeah. you know, we'll have a Notre Dame lapel pin on too, you know, <laughs> reminding us that he went to Notre Dame. And... Yeah. Yeah. Shove that down your throat too. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it, like I said, I, I still think you should, what you see now, it's, it, yeah, it doesn't look good. But I'd also, I'm one of those two that does wait for all the facts. And, yeah. You know, then I'll make right. my judgment, but like I said, it doesn't look good for right, right now. Yeah. Uh, Aaron, what do you think? I don't really have much to say on it just because it's still wide open, like Andy said, but I will tell you that I cannot wait 10, 20 years down the line when the Blackhawks 30 for 30 comes out because there's a ton of drama from this team. I mean, just, you know, probably the best time in Chicago hockey history and yep. just 
jam packed with drama. So uh, can't wait for that. But I, I don't know what to say on this one now. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. That's totally fair. Ray, what do you think? No comment. Yeah, no, I'm always somebody that you know, like Andy and 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 Pat said, and Patrick said that you know you, you got to wait for all the facts. You can't just jump on Twitter yeah. and see what everybody's saying. Yeah, um, but it would be absolutely crushing um, if winning and money became more important than doing what was right. You know, and, and you know, for me, um, you know, it's not like somebody crashed his car or had you know he was a little too drinky, and I wrapped it around a street pole and. You know, we had a car come pick them up and we took them home. You know, we're, we're talking about, you know, things that, you know, shouldn't. So never, Lance Briggs. Okay. Got it. Never, ever be swept under the rug. You know, so, I mean, if you're looking at it and saying, okay, you know, who was in that room? What happened? We're probably never going to know that because, you know, the investigation is going to go on. They're not going to come out and say, oh yeah, we're wrong. Here's a trillion dollars. Um, you know, so the organization, you know, what's crushing as a fan is they may have, you know, <laughs> done the unthinkable and tried to sweep something under the rug for money and, and, and winning. Um, yeah. and, and that's, that's tough to swallow as a fan. That, that's for sure. Because at, at the least of what we know, they didn't do the right thing once. And, and now right. we're trying to figure out all the facts, see what happened, who was in the room, who did what, you know, Hey, I'm your boss. You better listen to me. You know, we don't yeah. know what happened. Yeah. Yeah. You're so, right. You know, that, that's something that, you know, for judgment, for, for naming names and stuff like that, that's hard, but, Man, as an organization, if, if you swept something under the rug because of money and cups, man, that, that's that's hard to do. That, yeah. that, that's hard. That's hard to swallow. Yeah. All right, Eric. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave the final comment on this to Gate because my sense of timing on this is always perfect. Eric, what do you think? Sounds good. Yeah. I mean, I guess I wouldn't really have too much to add that hasn't been said. Um, maybe with the exception of, unfortunately, this really is not surprising. You know, with, with how they've with how they've handled this. Yeah, yeah. All right, Gate. What do you think, man? Well, I want to thank you for throwing it to Mr. Stankus because he is the authority on all things that stink. <laughs> <laughs> Funny guy. <laughs> Just like the old days, That's brother. <clears throat> yeah, but this it, it does bad. stink. Um, very. You know, Bray brings up some great points as well, and and the more you think about this, and in the way that, uh, um. It seems like they're going to keep Stan Bowman around. I mean, yeah. why would you be keeping him around at this point uh, unless you plan on keeping him long term? Why are you going to let him, you know, navigate the the, the, the entry draft and navigate the expansion draft right. if he's not going to be around? Uh, yeah. That would be stupid to do. So they're going to find a way to, to, to slither Stan out from under this and probably, you know, eventually say something like, uh, you know, that John McDonough had something to do with, it, and he was the sacrificial lamb, and 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 that's how they're doing this, doing this right. But he was the, you know, the the figurehead or whatever, or they may just insinuate that. But um, you know, it's getting to a point where it doesn't look like you know anyone significant is going to be let go, because why? You know, they know what happened, D despite what they're saying in this investigation. They know a lot more than they're leading on to. And if they flat out knew that Stan Bowman knew and he had a part in, in not reporting or whatever the, the stuff happens, like they would have let him go. He would have been gone. He should have been because it will eventually come out. So, you know, I, I'm not saying any of it's right. I'm just trying to say what I think is going to happen. I mean, I think yeah. generally it's, it's a horrible thing. Uh, you know, you, you didn't, you don't have an obligation to, uh, you know, they say you don't have the obligation to report that part to the police, but you do have obligations to then not uh, give this guy a job uh, or or at least recommend him for a job, teaching kids, working with kids, whatever. Just don't do anything. I mean, if you're going to fire him, don't give him a letter of recommendation at the very least. Don't give him a, a glowing recommendation where he yeah. gets jobs in other places and he does the same thing again. Yeah, uh, and that's, that's reprehensible. That's the, uh, there's two lawsuits and the second lawsuit is, is around that. And I think that's the one where they're in a little bit of trouble. I think yeah, the, um, the school, the Michigan school, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. sad. Like if it was your kid, yeah. you'd be furious that the, yeah. the Blackhawks did something like this and, yeah. and allowed this guy to, to, you know, to continue to prey on young kids yeah. or young players, whatever. 
Yeah, we're going to have to uh, revisit this uh, perhaps a little later on um, when, when we know a little bit more. Um, I'll rest and, the judgment on it. Don't worry about it, though. Uh, it, well, you know, frankly, it's hard not it's hard to look at this and read what's been reported um, and not come to some conclusions about what happened. Um, I, I don't think that the, I don't think the Hawks have actually disputed anything. They've just said, well, it happened 11 years ago. <laughs> Yeah, you know, that's so the other thing is they have not, they've they have they haven't denied a thing. Yeah, yeah. that's what is. Yeah, yeah, it's so all been really, legal, trying to get everything dismissed legally. Yeah, yeah, and so I mean that's what that was the the premise of their defense and trying to get the suit thrown out is that it happened over over ten years ago. Therefore, the statute of limitations has expired, but they didn't exactly deliver a forceful denial um, that this happened, and. Mm. Uh, so we'll we'll come back to this. I mean, it's 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 one more black eye in the organization, uh, an organization that's kind of been giving itself black eyes over and over again the last few years, and and it's it's been hard. It's been hard to stay a fan, but here we are, uh, the Blackhawks Ringcast. So um, we're not going to become the Icehawks Ringcast, I don't think. So uh, anyway, we will revisit. So I'm going to wrap this thing up. I'm going to say, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just saying it's very interesting, you know, Aaron mentioned and then he he bolted real quick, but the 30 for 30 on the Blackhawk years. And I know we've talked about, you know, all these players that also, you know, their demise was really quick and the retirements with the Shaws and Seabrooks and Corey Crawford. And, you know, we might find out years to come what these guys had to do, what they had to play through, what they were, yeah. what was asked of them. And it's turning yeah. out to be a very unique chapter. Uh, yeah, that's for sure. One yeah. that one that I'm I'm ter- I, I don't want to learn anything else because I want to <laughs> hold on to this as a fan as these yeah. gold my favorite Blackhawk years. I, I want to try to ignore anything bad about it, but it's hard to. It's it's heartbreaking to learn of this stuff. It really is. Glory and being on top is very fleeting. It seems like in professional sports, you're on top and then it's gone before you know it. There's there's it's there's rare. Like we are not going to see, it's a different era. We're not going to see the Edmonton dominance from years past and stuff like that. I think we're going to see the demise of the lightning coming up after, oh, yeah. the, after this yeah. off season. The salary cap does that. About yeah. to break up. Yeah. Um, Do you think, so, uh, you know, Gate being a Kraken guy, aren't, aren't the Kraken like, can we just take four of these lightning guys and no Hawks and no Red Wings? And I mean, yeah. And who wants to pick to anything from that list? That they uh, the the Blackhawks provided that is a list garbage. of garbage. Garbage. Yeah. I would say Carpenter. Anyway, sorry, that's I, I, me. Wait, but I thought he was yeah. trash according to Twitter. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> so I so Aaron just entered the waiting room as troll, and he's, he wants to be admitted. Guess what? what? We're not going to admit him. Carpenter had a great course. Uh, all right, let's um let's yeah, roll right. let's let's uh wrap this thing up. Let's wrap this thing up. Um, I want to thank our uh, everybody, all you and every, all of you for listening, um, all, all seven of you. Uh, but I want to thank our special guest, Patrick Stankus, formerly of Puck and Hostel. Pat, I Woo-hoo! hope you'll come, hope you'll come back and join us again. Um, it's uh, good to see you. Good, to, good to hear your voice. Um, our not so size ten four. <laughs> our not so special guest, gatekeeper. Um, we hope he'll come back, sort of. Um, the usual suspects, Ray Napientech, Andy Campbell, Sean Fitzgerald, Eric Andrews, and uh, and of course, Aaron, Aaron Goldschmidt, um, also known as Troll. I want to thank our sponsor, P-U-C-K-H-C-K-Y. You see them right over Gates' right shoulder there. Can uh, confirm. Our, our founding sponsors, go check them out, P-U-C-K-H-C-K-Y dot com. They, the- they, also, they also just released, sorry, I, uh, they also just released some new lines. Disturbed, my boys nice. in Disturbed, nice. and nice. Uh, some Metallica stuff, and a oh, bunch of new lines. So they got a lot of great stuff. Yeah, I'm gonna go check that out because those are two of my favorite bands. So, um, so check them out. PCK, ATKY. Use that the rink T H E R I N K discount code. Get ten percent off. Um, anybody got any plugs? Gate, you got any plugs? Plugs. Uh, no, I can't think of anything off the, off the top of my head. I mean, we're going to fire up the, uh, crack and hostile Seattle ring cast, uh, you know, after all this stuff is, is done, but, um, you know, right now I'm, I'm, I'm actually moving homes. So it's a little hard for me to, to set up the podcast stuff, but I've got some guests hopefully lined up coming up. Might have some, uh, some people, uh, I, I've, 
made some connections out in Seattle with a couple of people. Nice. Uh, one particular person is a family member of a high ranking executive in the NHL. And uh, he's a good friend. Yeah. He's, he's a good friend of mine and uh, part, you know, I'm pretty much part of my family. So uh, we're going to have him on and uh, you know, some of the rink staff will, that will, will be joining us from time to time. Maybe I'll even have a Patrick Stankus on sometime. It was nice having as a neighbor while it lasted. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. It's good to have you two guys back together. Definitely. Thank you for it's having me. It's good to banter. Yeah. The banter. So, all right. Um, listen, everybody, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, you know, we really appreciate you, the, those of you who do listen to us here on the Facebook or um, download us on iTunes, leave a review, uh, hopefully something nice. Um, if you're going to say something bad, say it about Gabe. Um, beyond that, uh, thanks everybody. We're looking forward to a, a crazy off season and, um, you know, a, 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 a probably, hopefully, um, an interesting uh, regular season and who knows, maybe make the playoffs. I doubt it, but we'll see. Um, until then, until our next episode, which we'll probably do after the draft, uh, maybe we'll even uh, bring in, um, you know, some, some third party draft expert um, like Wiz or somebody like that to, uh, to weigh in. Um, but until then, we will see you on the rink. <laughs>